welcome to another edition of Inside Medicine. I'm your host, Doug Geinzer, the CEO of Las Vegas Heels. And we're here in the studio today with Dr. Neil Gokul, the Medical Director of Clinical Education for Southwest Medical Associates. And we're going to get to know him in just a few minutes. For those of you that are new to Inside Medicine, we broadcast in the studio here live every Thursday. And if you do happen to miss an episode, you're able to catch that on our website, our YouTube channel. If you receive our email newsletter, it will come out in Heal's Headlines. And then, of course, we put it up on iTunes, Roku, Stitcher, Spotify, and a bunch of those other social media sites. Uh, We like to bring in experts and leaders in the healthcare industry that are doing amazing things to improve the quality of health right here in Southern Nevada, those that are involved in medical travel, medical education. And today we're going to talk about that subject itself, medical education and what's been going on with the expansion of graduate medical education and the residencies that are expanding throughout the Valley. Doctor, welcome to the studio. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks for being here. Before we dive in, our audience really likes to get to know our guests. So let's talk about you for a few minutes. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, where you uh, did some of your training and how you ended up here in Las Vegas. Absolutely. So I kind of trained bi-coastally, spent some time in undergraduate in Southern California, went off to the East Coast, Northern New Jersey and New York area for some training of medical school as well as residency where I stayed on for seven years Um, and then moved back here to Las Vegas where my family had initially come over from South Africa. So the initial home base for us and since finishing residency training, it's where I started practicing. So it was always considered home base and nice to make that return here. Uh, I was very young when I decided I wanted to go into medicine, although I knew I didn't want to do it through a necessarily traditional route. We had a lot of exposure through medical diseases and conditions through my family, um, and I knew that I definitely wanted to explore engineering. I wanted to learn about education. So I studied both of those in undergraduate, knowing that I would eventually end up in medicine. And I did get there along the ways working in Washington, D.C. in healthcare and legislation for a while, but eventually got myself into medicine. And since being back in Las Vegas or hometown um, has been a tremendous change and just a really great opportunity to expand all of my experiences. And you're in family medicine, correct? Yes, I am. Which is critical. A lot of people don't realize the role of primary care physicians and what that means. It's uh, we're grossly underserved in that area. So thank you for, for, for being there. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about the why. I read a little story. Your sister had some uh, some situations yes. and you were around that and that's what really got you motivated about medicine. So if you don't mind, share that story because it was very touching. Absolutely. So yes, my oldest sister, who many people when they see her assume she's the youngest of us because she's the shortest, she's the tiniest of all of our family. Um, she was born in South Africa at the time. There was very limited access, especially for certain races to healthcare, medical care period. Um, And the life expectancy that my parents were given when she was born was somewhere between eight to 12 months. Mm. Um, And it was after a few years that they were trying and struggling to leave South Africa that they made it to the USA and had several encounters with many physicians. My sister by age 12 had 18 surgeries on her back, um, many of which contributed to her physical uh, incapabilities and certainly the emotional and financial stress that goes along with that for her as a patient as well as my parents who are struggling adapting to a whole new country um, that they had migrated to. Um, Along the way, so many challenges that were really difficult and heartbreaking. I remember uh, one of the times she had her titanium rod in her back snap um, and my father was just carrying her and we were waiting outside the surgeon's office for the door to open um, and he was almost told he couldn't be let in without an appointment Um, and it was Mm. staggering to think of um, and those moments were were certainly emotional and there were many that were also quite the opposite. I remember the orthopedist who was much like a giant teddy bear and I remember his face to this day uh, because he truly was a hero for my sister. Um, when she went from initially being given a very limited life expectancy to then being told she's not going to be able to walk or or do certain things. Um, He really made a huge difference in her. We saw him very frequently. He he was very close to the family after several surgeries. And, you know, she's limited in capacity, but very much with us today. She maintains all of her own independence and does very much walk and is is quite smart in, in very many ways. Uh, much more than than the rest of us, and she's quite a blessing to have. That's an amazing story, so thank you for sharing. Absolutely. So we want to learn about 
I'm curious what a medical director of clinical education does. Uh, but before we dive into there, Southwest Medical Associates, give us kind of the overlay of what Southwest Medical Associates is in the role that it plays in our community. Absolutely. So Southwest Medical has been around for many years here in the Valley and through tremendous changes in the healthcare landscape, we have changed along with that, with the ideas of innovation, which is one of our core values, as we like to call it. We recognize that everything is constantly changing. And if we're not open and adept to that, we really won't keep up with the needs of our population, our population that is growing very quickly, um, our older population who are living longer, having more chronic conditions and needing more people to help take care of that are some of the challenges that we've recognized in doing so. We have a presence in the community that's not just one solely as a doctor's office. We recognize the idea of what we call population health, this idea that there's many factors that go into the well-being of our communities, psychosocial factors, religion, cultural factors, all of these things that really play a role not simply just me as a physician looking at a patient and saying, here's your medication, I need to need you to take it. There's so many other roads, challenges, building blocks that are involved in creating that relationship, first of all, and then creating a successful outcome in that. And we really work towards building that from a lot of different angles. We definitely recognize the patient experiences of utmost importance, of course. Um, we wanna know that they feel well taken care of, not just that we think we're taking good care of them, but I, as a provider, also want to feel that I'm doing a good job at what I'm doing. And we look at all of these different pieces of how we're providing cost-effective quality care that satisfies the patient, but is also satisfying to me as a provider, because I need to know that I'm doing well um, and in order for myself to be well as well. That's great. And you're on clinical faculty at two different medical schools, not just one, but two. Uh, so the UNLV School of Medicine and the soon-to-be uh, Roseman College of Medicine. Yes. So tell us a little bit about those roles and what you do for both of the these medical schools. Absolutely. So we've been very proud to be a supporting community partner for UNLV when they started their medical school. Um, and we worked directly with their curriculum committee from day one. They started a very different program of early immersion for their medical students. So in typical um, traditional medical schools, it was not until year three or four of medical school that we left our books aside to actually go and see what is it like to be in front of a patient? What are the tools that we use? And when you think about it, that seems like a long time to be studying before you see that to really know where you fit, how you fit, or if you want to fit into that. Um, so it's a remarkable different approach that they're taking. And we were very glad to be able to be a part of that. So rather than just sending these students out to a physician or a care provider to see what they do, we really ingrained in them what their intent was. So we have these students come they come and stay with us and they come every week to two weeks and it's a whole rotating throughout a year. We've just finished the first year with them and are welcoming their second year class um, to really give them an idea of the differences, the nuances, and as I mentioned before, the changes in medicine and what that really means to impact and enhance what they're studying as well. I love the fact that they um, require all of their students to become an EMT first. Absolutely. Because they get to touch patients and they get to really understand what the delivery of care looks like. And this is before they even pick up that first book. Definitely. I think that's so important because I remember back to medical school and even in our first month of medical school, and you're th talking about so many students who worked so hard for so many years to get into a very competitive spot. And after that first month, there was a plane full of students who just decided this is not for me. And yeah. it's great that they recognize it. And also challenging that they spent so much time devoted yeah. to that before that happened. So um, absolutely so great that they become EMTs. They get uh, a lot of exposure to what it's like to deal with patients in challenging environments, to get to have hands-on time with patients, to really enforce, one, if medicine is the right fit for them, and also help guide them to where their fit within the world of medicine might be. So the Roseman College of Medicine, another medical school, you're on their faculty there as well. Yes. Uh, what does that look like? Very excited to recently have been appointed as Associate Professor of Family Medicine, working alongside the Roseman faculty in a soon-to-be medical school where we will also embrace their medical students to be a part of this growing effort in managing our population, offer our resources and guidance to let them see the changing landscape of medicine and what we're doing to keep up with that. 
So a couple years ago, Southwest Medical really embraced medical education. You're the clinical director and the medical director of clinical education. So I want to know a little bit more about that. But uh, equally as important, Southwest really embraced the role of the APRN. Uh, and so I want to hear a little bit more about that. So share a what does the medical director of clinical education do? Uh, and then what does the role of the APRN play within the whole ecosystem over there? Absolutely. One of my most exciting things is getting to tell people about my job, not just because of my title, but it really aligns two of my passions, both medicine and education, which truly do come hand in hand. Um, as we're looking at the changing face of medicine and knowing all of these challenges that we're facing day to day, it's important to recognize that our educators, our learners, and our care providers need to be aware and kept on top of these things while they have busy day-to-day -day lives, both personally and professionally. As director of clinical education, I look into seeing how we can foster relationships sooner and how that might be more beneficial both to the care provider and their team, as well as to our patients. So it's very easy for us to go out as a company and, and go to job fairs and look for people and say, we want you to come work for us and this is what we do. It's a whole different story and a whole different world when we actually go into a part of somebody's training. We guide them side by side along with us so that they see what our approach to primary care is they get an exposure to the resources that we use. They get to utilize that technology and data and see what we're doing with these large populations and track it to see what kind of changes we're making so that as they're learning this in their training process, when they're ready to be fully licensed and come out and work in their communities, we hope that's with us, but wherever they may be, they recognize all of those challenges, all of those nuances, and the idea of being innovative and constantly thinking about ways they can always improve their quality and efficiency of care that they deliver. We recognize that a lot of this can't be done solely by ourselves. As much as I want to do for a patient within the four walls of the exam room, I can't do all of that myself. I don't have the bandwidth. I don't have the time. I don't have all of the resources. I need a team approach, and I need tools and therapists and nurses and all kinds of different people with their own um, specialties to help me provide the care that I know my patient needs and the care that I want to deliver to them. And we've recognized that with our APRNs, being very specific um, because nurses by trade are a different breed altogether. Um, I'm very proud of all of the APRNs and the nurses I get to work with. Nurses through medical training are notorious for always being that bastion of support for physicians, especially early on. Um, and that doesn't get recognized quite enough. Nurses are certainly a special type of population that really provide a great level of care to our patients and really provide a great support to us as care providers as well. And so we've recognized that having an APRN as part of our care team, they can help bridge some of the gaps that sometimes I might face with my patients, whether that's being a little bit more close on a personal level with patients or being able to help support my patients and know that they have some guidance when maybe I'm not there or not available so that we always have access and patients are not feeling like they don't have an ability to reach out to us. That's great. And Southwest not only embraced the APRNs, but you've embraced PAs and you created a program called PA Pathways. Tell us a little bit about that program because it's unique. Yes, the PA Pathways program with Toro University is now in its third year. What we saw in the Valley is that these PAs were graduating and going out and they were even coming to work for us, which is great. Uh, but there's always this gap. It's very similar to myself as a physician when I finished residency training and then went out into practice. It took some time and there was this whole learning curve. And sometimes that was upwards of a year, a year and a half to really recognize that change in what I really doing in practical medicine versus in training medicine. So we took advantage of stepping in earlier. We took in and went in with these PAs in their final year, which is their clinical year. We hired them on as employees and they became part of our family the whole time still in their intern or learning role. And they did their year of clinical rotations with us, with us in primary care, in all of our subspecialties, the whole while utilizing our electronic, electronic health records our resources, data and technology teams, and utilizing all of our subspecialists as well, so that by the end of their training, 
they not only knew what they were doing from a medical standpoint, they knew of all of these resources. They understood our aim and mission in our community with population health, and they had established great relationships. I love with my PA who trained with me for a year um, and is now my PA at the office, is so close to those subspecialists that he trained with within my company that he'll call or text um, for any patient case and things that maybe might take a day or a week to get resolved, he gets done very quickly because he's established those relationships. So it really bastions this idea that we're creating a network and a family of care providers to really deliver optimal care. It's amazing what you've done just to integrate, you know, you're on faculty for two med schools, but now you brought up a third one, which is Toro, and what they're doing with their PA pathways. But you really am bringing together what Southwest Medical is doing with the medical schools and improving population health. And I'm curious, everybody has a different definition. Popu what is the your definition of population health and why does it matter and what's Southwest doing to address that? Yes, you're very right. Population health is a widely used term uh, with a lot of different definitions. Some of the overlap is that it recognizes that there's many factors that go into the idea of being well or the delivery of health care involving psychosocial factors, cultural, religious, economic factors that all play into medical care. Uh, we recognize at Southwest Medical that population health is certainly a combination of the art and science of both preventing disease, promoting and improving health care. And my favorite thing to say, and it truly is what we do, is ensuring that our patients are living their best possible life. Um, we don't have all of the answers. What we know is that we have a lot of resources to help get those answers for our patients. And it really is focused on improving the trajectory of care. I mentioned before, as much as we're concerned with that patient in the exam room, we're also concerned with their care beyond the confines of the walls of the exam room. We want to know about their care at home and their family members and their community and neighborhoods because those are our communities as well. And we recognize that all of these learning institutions at Toro and UNLV and Roseman are a big part of that because our population is only growing and we know that we need more quality care providers and we want to be a part of establishing that. So it's great. So you're obviously deeply involved with UME, undergraduate medical education, medical education, as well as graduate medical education, which uh, Las Vegas Heels has played an uh, instrumental role in bringing that uh, to fruition in Las Vegas. Recently, you partnered up with the Valley Health System for a family medicine, your specialty, uh, residency program. What does that look like? When does that start? And how does our population benefit from that? I'm so excited about our residency program that starts this July with our first class of 10 family medicine residents, which will make it the largest family medicine residency in Nevada. Um, a very exciting feat that we've come together with a lot of resources and a lot of support from many different areas. We recognize that not only do we need these providers in primary care, which I'm such a big proponent of, not just because I'm a primary care physician myself, but part of the reason that I went into family medicine is recognizing that it establishes relationships, trust, and delivers medicine in a different way than many other specialties do. Uh, I'm very proud to be a part of that. As we bring these residents into the community, our hope and our goal as we attracted and, and chose our very select few um, are that they're very committed to our neighborhoods, our communities, and our population here in Southern Nevada, where we know that that care is very much needed. Being part of this training program from the ground up means that as we're providing them with the access to very valuable learning tools, they're also going to learn the technology, our innovative resources, using our data to put forth in our populations a lot of their own innovative styles as younger providers and very different backgrounds, how we can continue to impact our population for a more positive outcome. Yeah, so it's it's great because as we know, where they do the residency typically leads to where they stay. Uh, so if we could keep the national average is 67%, we'll stay where they do residency. So if we're able to retain uh, those new practitioners, those new physicians in this community, it'll benefit because our community is just growing so, so fast. What does that do to the entire dynamics of what Southwest Medical does? Because one of the fastest growing cities in the United States and we're attracting an aging population as well. So how is Southwest uh, Medical addressing that? 
Yes. Yeah, so it's so great that you mentioned that because we do have a rapidly growing population. And in general, in this country, our elderly patients are living longer lives, which leads to more chronic conditions. And they need more care and more resources to help them live those quality lives. As we're bringing these residents here, it makes me think about where I trained and I loved my residency program. And many of the people I trained with were family to me and leaving that was difficult. Part of the nuance here is that not only are these providers learning and coming to be in this community, they'll have a patient population in the three years that they are doing their training here. And when they transition into full-time care with us, they won't lose those patients as they typically do in residency scenarios when people move on to full-time practice because they'll stay here in our communities practicing with us at Southwest Medical, part of Optum, and continue to maintain those patients. And they'll have that continuity, which is so vital to family medicine um, and preventative care in general. When we're looking at our population that's growing so fast, we rank very lowly in the country when it comes to a ratio of care providers to patients. We recognize that. Any provider that you see here in the Valley, I'm sure recognizes it. I know I hear it all day, every day, and I have for several years from my patients. It's so hard to get in to see you. It's so hard to get an appointment. And we recognize that. We fully recognize that we need to not just say, I know I'm busy. We need to be a part of bringing quality providers to our Valley for our patients. And that means being a part of their training, investing in their learning, guiding them from the ground up so that we can surely vouch for these providers to say, I know that I couldn't get you in with me and I can get you in with my PA, my APRN, or my doctor colleague who has trained with me, who understands you and understands us and what we're aiming to do here so that they establish those trusting relationships recognize that that compassion is going throughout all of us as a team to really impact their care. And you touched on something that's really, it's a national problem. So our number of physicians per population is some of the lowest in the country. And so we're in dire need of more physicians in this community. Because of that, our physician base that's here, we're serving the population, but we're also working a lot harder. Uh, which leads to physician burnout. Talk to us a little bit about physician burnout, why that's on your radar screen, and what we uh, as a community can do to address that. Absolutely. For many years in medicine, we practice within this idea of a triple aim, trying to focus on quality health care that's cost-effective and satisfying to the patient. And it was this triangle of these three ideas that we were constantly trying to aim and achieve. And just as you said, we recognized, well, yes, but I'm one person and I have this pool of this many people that I'm having to do this for. Without the appropriate resources and support, you start to not see that happen. And when you're in any role, but especially in medicine, and you find that you're not delivering quality health care in a healing environment, that is what contributes to what we call or refer to as, as burnout. I'm not feeling like I'm doing what I want to be doing, what I need to be doing. We soon developed a fourth aim, or what we call the quadruple aim, recognizing that provider satisfaction is integral to be able to do what we want to do. In order to make sure that I'm providing quality, cost-effective care that's satisfying to my patient, I also have to be satisfied to do that. I have to be well in order to do well. I like to say it and I say it all the time um, because if we're not recognizing that, that's a piece that is not going to help with realistic expectations. So we look at all of these avenues of what a physician or any care provider does day to day. All of these aspects that we've taken out down to the basics and seen where can we improve, what can we change? Things like the setup of our exam rooms to improve efficiency, how our electronic health record works so that I'm not separating myself to a computer from myself to a patient, integrating them into that team so that they can access that care record as well. So rather than this beast in the room, it becomes something that they recognize as part of their care. They utilize that and it's not something I have to worry about utilizing when I'm in the room because I know it's improving our efficiencies. We look at all of the different teams that we need for support. If I need health educators to help me talk to somebody about their diabetes or blood pressure, about their weight loss or smoking and why that matters to them, I have those resources to be able to do that. If I need a social worker to really help me with someone who's struggling with a difficult home situation, I can bring them in and it doesn't have to be face-to-face. -face. We've again looked at things that are innovative. Our patients 
have busy lives just as we do. They don't always have the ability to just go everywhere I want them to go. So sometimes they need our telehealth platform, phone calls, things that are different. We have teams that go to our patients' homes that help get these things done. Yesterday, my mother received this email and you know, I, I love seeing my mother do this because she's the most non-technological person you will ever meet, uh, ever. And so to see her on her phone saying, oh, I got an email from my primary care provider and they're going to set up an appointment for me and my husband, my dad, um, to come home and do some of these preventative measures since we're so busy and haven't been able to schedule our appointment. That's what we recognize our patients need. We can't just say, we're here. It's up to you to come and see us. That's not how it works. We create this team model to know that we're part of this. We're in this with you. We walk in the shoes that they wear and recognize some of these nuances. I always like to reference my own clinic where I work up at Sunrise Market um, on the northeast part of town um, because we're a special set of providers, our nurse practitioners, PAs, and physicians who work there to really recognize our patients, many of whom use public transportation, which in extreme temperatures, our winter or summer months, may mean that our patients show up one, two, or three hours late. Um, patients are not turned away. That doesn't also mean that providers are expected to work all hours and stay there all time because that's what you do. We recognize that it goes both way and we work as a team with that. I'm very open with my pr providers and my care team when I tell them, I fully trust that you're going to make a good decision that's most compassionate and in value for this patient because we all do that together. And if it means that I cannot squeeze this patient into my schedule two hours late because I have too much going on in my personal life, that's okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I also have a team PA or an APRN or maybe one of my physician colleagues who will be able to see that patient so that they don't get turned away. We want to walk in the shoes that our patients wear and recognize that they all come from different walks of life. So this addition going from the triple aim to the quadruple aim and the provider satisfaction, absolutely critical. Southwest is building its culture around provider satisfaction. Spend a little time talking to us a little bit about the other benefits of working for Southwest Medical because we need more doctors. Many of the primary care physicians come to work for Southwest. What is so attractive that they all want to come work for you? Absolutely. And that's easy because I'll tell you my story. Uh, when I left residency and came to practice in Southern Nevada, I went to a couple different practices um, in a short five-year period, which is something I really didn't expect. As a family medicine physician coming from the residency program that I did, I didn't think it would be hard to find my place in medicine. And what I found was that there's so many different opportunities out there, um, and many of which are little islands. Um, and when we go through residency, you're almost forced into this idea of a community because you're at your most vulnerable and you're spending countless hours with these people side by side. They become your closest comrades, your closest family by the time you're done with training. And then you go out into practice and there's nobody behind you. There's no support system. There's no connection. And it quickly gets you into a sense of feeling like you're lost or not doing what you intended to do. When I joined Southwest Medical, I was truly at a point in my career that I felt a little burned out myself. I wanted to be somewhere that I knew had resources. I could just go in and take care of my patients and go home at the end of the day and be done with it. Um, and that didn't last long to my surprise. Uh, when I joined Southwest, I recognized the resources and support system, the community of care providers that I had along with me who are facing the same day-to-day -day struggles and not just to sit there and complain about it, but recognizing that there's a problem here and we need to do something about it and having support and the teams and the data and informatics to be able to make those changes and to see what those changes made. It made a tremendous change in how I felt about my career as well as in my ability to deliver care. And so when I talk to people about looking for their job or making a career choice, we know that as physicians, as care providers, that's ingrained from us. I don't want to separate myself from that because it's who I am. It certainly is part of my identity. And we need to recognize that while also making realistic expectations and setting practical goals. We've looked at what is the right number of patients that we see per a day so that we're getting access to our patients, but also not feeling like we're overwhelmed, like we're not going home uh, at the end of each day with so many more hours of work to do when that should be time with our families. We recognize that 
Getting home for dinner is important. We want all of our providers to be doing that. We want them to feel satisfied in what they're doing. And part of that means utilizing these teams and resources that we have to help us look at things differently. And it surprises me because even after each day when I think I've got it right, I learn something new and I learn something different. And that comes from all of these different teams, whether it's our data team, our tech team, our patient experience team, or our efficiency or lean team, somebody that can come and say, this is great what you're doing. And did you recognize this? Did you recognize this tool? Did you know about this resource that can help you just do things a little bit differently? Dr. Gokul, thank you. This was very informational. We learned a lot about you, a lot about Southwest Medical Associates, uh, your passion uh, for delivering exceptional care and for family medicine. So thank you for all that you're doing, but our show has got to wrap up. So I think we've got enough to probably cover another show at some point in time. So we'll invite you back to the studio. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. And for those of you that uh, joined us a little bit late, feel free to catch up on this episode on any of the stations that we mentioned before. And we look forward to seeing you next Thursday for another edition of Inside Medicine. Have a great day.